All right, good evening, everyone. We are going to begin this evening with our land acknowledgement. Milton Hall Montessori schools in their physical manifestation and address are in Etobicoke and Toronto. This land is uniquely situated along the Humber River watershed, which historically provided an integral connection for Aboriginal peoples between Lakeshore of Ontario and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay region. This area falls within the traditional territory of Wendat, Anashu Bay, and Odenosh oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Odenonshi people. As a learning community that has the priv privilege to live and work on the land, we are required to be aware, knowledgeable, and active in the indigenization of our organization. Territory acknowledgements are one effort towards disputing and dismantling colonial structures and act in a very small part to undo indigenous erasure. Education, and perhaps most particularly Montessori education, has social power and thus the responsibility to reflect, disrupt, and repair the ongoing effects of colonialism. Good evening, everybody. My name is Catherine, and I'm the Director of Admissions for the Milton Hall School and your host tonight. I'm pleased to welcome our presenter this evening, Valerie T. Valerie has 25 years of experience as a speaker and facilitator and has been featured on numerous podcasts, parenting summits, and CBC Morning Radio. She helps parents close the gap between who they wanna be as parents and the day-to-day -day reality of parenting. Her courses and customized coaching intertwine positive discipline, brain science, and research-based best parenting practices. She is a trained art therapist and teacher, as well as a positive discipline coach. Many thanks to our Tattle Creek parent, Nishma Ruda, for tonight's coordination and support, as well as Rebecca for tonight's tech support. Without further ado, I'd like to present Valerie. Thank you for that very sweet introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen. <clears throat> Hopefully, can I get a thumbs up if everyone can see that? Okay, excellent. All right, well, I wanna start uh, by saying I'm gonna be using the word disability. And I'm aware that uh, some people don't like that word. <laughs> and even I was a member of a Facebook group, uh, Toronto Parents of Special Needs Children. And there was a vote to change the name of the Facebook group to Toronto Parents of Children with Disabilities. And it started a very heated debate. Um, wow, it was it was it was very heated. So I just want to acknowledge that different people prefer different terminology, and I'm going to use the word disability. The other thing I want to mention is I'm going to be speaking, um, you know, in in uh, light of World Down Syndrome Day coming up. I'm going to be advocating for people with disabilities and for people with Down syndrome tonight. But I want to acknowledge that the best place to find information about inclusion is from the people with those disabilities themselves. There's so many great uh, advocates um, with Down syndrome. I encourage you to follow them on social media. They're really funny, like these two um, <clears throat> British people with Down syndrome. That's why it says Downs syndrome instead of Down syndrome. Uh, that's the term they use in Britain, but they're they're hilarious. There's things that like they say that irritate them that people say to them. And um, so, yeah, I encourage you to if you want to learn more about a specific disability to follow uh, advocates with that disability. So our introduction, my husband and I, um, our son, Tyler, when he was born, was diagnosed with Down syndrome and we'd never met anyone with Down syndrome. That was really terrifying for us, it was actually as if the floor opened up and we got sucked down into it, into despair, how the news was delivered to us, uh, just our lack of experience with people with disabilities. <clears throat> so we didn't really know what the future held for us and, and for our older son as well. We were, we were really terrified. 
And luckily we had the courage to tell one of our friends that our son had Down syndrome. And then they said, oh, we know a family who has a, a son with Down syndrome. So my husband went for coffee with that person. And the dad said to uh, my husband um, about their son, if I could trade my son for a typical child, I wouldn't. And we really held on to those words until we learned more about what Down syndrome was, what life would be like for our son. but. Just so you know, where my starting point was um, really in a place of fear and, and not knowing much. So fast forward now, our son is 11. This is him just a couple weeks ago um, on the slopes with his big brother and our husband. And um, yeah, so now we, we're in a different spot, obviously. <clears throat> um, I want to just do a little bit of a, of a quiz just to kind of get an idea um, what you know. So in the chat, if you could type in true or false, do you think the last institution in Ontario, so by institution, I mean a place where uh, people were separated from their families who had intellectual disabilities and were placed into these institution or homes <clears throat> and then their care now was in the institution rather than with their family. So do you think 1982, the last one, is that true or false? What are your, what are your thoughts? Okay, I see a false, I see a true. It's actually false. So the last, uh, does anyone know when the last institution, uh, when it was closed down in Ontario? Yes, 2009 was the last, uh, so this is very recent. Um, so for, for a long time, uh, people with intellectual disabilities were separated from their families. Even in the eighties, it was an act of courage to bring your, your child home from the hospital and raise your child with your family. So <clears throat> if we consider that, you know, people being separated from their families and, uh, being raised in these institutions, very similar to a residential schools, you know, people did not fare well. Um, and so there is sort of an, a bias, especially in Ontario with people with intellectual disabilities, sort of our, our thoughts of it is, you know, people who, who were raised in these homes and, and didn't always uh, fare well. So I would say my first tip for, for being more inclusive would be to aware, be aware of societal's, especially in Ontario, biases towards people with disabilities. And it can be very, very insidious, um, even in the language that we use. You know, for instance, um, there's a new blood test to, to, it's called to screen for Down syndrome. So screen would suggest to get rid of, and there's a lot of pressure on new parents. I used to host a new parent coffee night. So a lot of parents came very distraught, feeling quite traumatized that there was a lot of pressure uh, to end their pregnancies. And I'm not here to uh, ha have a pro-life message, but I, I do feel that there wasn't a neutral, there isn't still today, not a neutral message being uh, given to parents. So, you know, I would say for myself and a lot of other parents, Sometimes we're worried, will there be uh, people with Down syndrome in the future? <clears throat> All right. Do you think this is true or false? There are three types of Down syndrome. What do you think? You can put T for true, F for false. It is indeed true. There are three kinds of Down syndrome. Um, our son has trisomy 21. So that means he has three copies of the 21st chromosome. There's also mosaic Down syndrome. So that means some of the cells in the body are typical and some have uh, 23 copies of the 21st chromosome. That's mosaic Down syndrome. And then there's translocation Down syndrome where um, the part of the 21st chromosome breaks off and then uh, attaches to another chromosome, usually the 14th or 15th chromosome. So there are indeed three types of Down syndrome. And I mention this because, um, you know, 
there can sometimes be a very 2D version of what uh, people think Down syndrome might be. Uh, I remember it was so striking to me. I saw this play when Tyler was six weeks old called Rare by Judith Thompson. And it was a docudrama of nine adults with Down syndrome speaking to what it's like to have Down syndrome, what it's like to be them. And um, we had been given a list of everything that could go wrong for our child. So we were really focused on the diagnosis in this. I'm so grateful to this play because you know, one of the women spoke five languages, one of the men was gay, another person um, lived on his own after his parents passed, and another one wanted to be an actor. So I was just really thinking like, wow, our son, who does he want to be in the world? Will he be gay? Like what, you know, it just really woke me up to see, um, you know, past the diagnosis to uh, people. So um, I love this saying that, you know, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. If you met one person with Down syndrome, you've met one person with Down syndrome or ADHD or any kind of neurodiversity. So my second tip to be more inclusive is to really get to know uh, people as individuals and to be curious and open because <clears throat> different disabilities manifest in so many different ways. All right, people with Down syndrome have special needs, true or false? All right, I'm gonna play you a little video and then see what you think. People with Down syndrome have special needs. Special needs? Really? It would be special if people with Down syndrome needed to eat dinosaur eggs. That would be special. One dinosaur egg. Enjoy. <laughs> Yeah, you were totally right about Lindsay. If we need to wear a giant suit of armor, that would be special. I got it. Turn up me, Lady Patton. Baby, you don't want to have my face. So go ahead and get to the service. It would be special if we need to be massaged by a cat. Uh... If we needed to be woken up by celebrity. Wakey, wakey, takes a bakey. You may know me from drops or office space. The darker flakes, the rock, plateau, Wall Street. Funny story, I, I played this. My bad. That would be special. But what we really need is education jobs and opportunities, friends at the love, just like everybody else. Are these needs special? So yeah, I would say um, the needs of, of all people with disabilities and people with Down syndrome are human needs. Uh, in a lot of my courses, I teach about the four psychological needs that every child needs to be met, whether they're typical or they have a disability, um, our, ourselves as adults, what we need. So I'm, you know, kind of if I'm checking how I'm doing as a parent, I'm always looking at these, these four um, psycho psychological needs. And um, I've put a link in the chat, but I have a handout that goes deep. I could do a whole two hours on these four needs, but I wanted to share with you some resources if you want to go a little bit deeper with that. But every child needs to feel connected. Every child needs to feel capable. Every child needs to feel that they count, that they belong. Um, and every child needs to feel courage that they can handle what's happening, uh, what's coming their way, that it's okay to make mistakes. So um, these are based on Alfred Adler's theory and Betty Lou Bettner changed them into the four C's. So I have a little uh, download, but, but all children, regardless, really want these four psychological needs met.
<clears throat> so the tip is people with disabilities have the same psychological needs as everyone else. <clears throat> People with Down syndrome are happy all the time, true or false. I think Nishma might have an opinion on this. Yes. <laughs> I hear all the time, oh, you're so lucky. People with Down syndrome are always so happy. Um, so I'm just going to play a little, I'm going to debunk this myth right now. Are you still yeah. so yeah. upset? You want? Are you so sad? You want sing sing a song, la 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 song, the carpenters. Okay, let's go put on things in a song. Uh, every time um, Tyler was really sad, he'd ask us to play um, the uh, Karen Carpenters um, that sing sing a song. Um, that would always cheer him up. So, but I. I really sometimes it it it's a little bit hurtful when when people speak about uh, our son that way in a kind of a two dimensional way, and um, I just really appreciate when people are open and willing to see his full humanity. He gets angry, he gets frustrated, he's happy, he's sad, he's all of these things. Um, I would also recommend that most adults with Down syndrome and people with Down syndrome really prefer uh, person first language. <clears throat> so related to that. So instead of saying, you know, that's a Down's kid or, um, you know, a, a Down syndrome person, um, most adults with Down syndrome prefer to have um, their identity be person first. So I'm an adult with Down syndrome or that person has Down syndrome. So the Down syndrome is just one aspect of who they are, um, but that their personal identity is first. I will say there is a caveat to that because not all people with disabilities prefer person first language. Some people um, prefer identity first language that I'm, I'm autistic. And, and prefer that. So I would still say it's person first is maybe ask the person first, um, the adult, what their, what their preference is. And, but generally speaking, people with Down syndrome and parents of children with Down syndrome really, really like it when uh, people use person first uh, language. All right, wait at least 10 seconds when you ask a question, true or false. Oh, I see your comment there, Sarah, about uh, the books about institutionalization. Thank you for that, World Without Martha. Those are great. And the <clears throat> um, Unloved, that documentary is fantastic about your Ontario as well. It's not for the faint of heart. It's it's really actually upsetting to read many of the abuses that happen. And unfortunately, apologies uh, did not happen for survivors until 2014. So it's been a long time coming to acknowledge some of the hurts that happened there. Um, it is true. So um, you know, a lot of times I see people asking our son a question and then when he doesn't respond right away, they ask us or, and don't really just give that little extra time. So um, if you imagine uh, a cable, like an electrical cord, and you know, the, the electricity moving in this cord is, is gonna be protected by this rubber coating. And the brain is, is very similar. There is the axon that carries the messages. If you imagine the, our thoughts and electrical messages traveling along there and they're protected like this cable has rubber around it by this myelin sheath. And people with Down syndrome, their, their myelin sheath isn't as fully developed. So sometimes if you imagine if I cut some of this rubber off this cord, some of the electricity might shoot out or be dissipated. So it's similar with thinking that sometimes the thoughts aren't as um, connected. And, and so it takes longer to interpret the message, then think about the response and then answer. And if you think of 10 seconds, like elephant one, elephant two, elephant three, elephant four, elephant five, you know, 10 seconds 
might feel a little bit uncomfortable having a little bit longer silence, but um, it can be really helpful to just give the person time to collect their thoughts, think about how they're going to form that sentence in their mouth and then, and then answer. It takes a little bit of time. So having some patience and, and waiting a little bit can make a big difference in inclusion and communication. All right. And also, um, yeah, so speaking directly to the child and waiting, um, not just defaulting to the parents. Even if someone's nonverbal, I think it's so important to speak directly to the person rather than to their parents. Um, it can really help them feel included and feel part, part of things. Uh, people with Down syndrome love to hug, so let them. True or false, what do you think? <clears throat> Yeah, definitely false. Um, there are some innocent behaviors for any child, things that that um, children do that might be um, innocent and, and they don't realize um, that they shouldn't be doing it. But there are also some misguided behaviors and that goes for our children as well. And so I think it's really important if, if your child's uncomfortable or you're uncomfortable with the behavior, um, to be very specific, to, so for example, um, please stop hugging me. And then so that they don't feel uh, shut out or excluded, then I, I like to encourage kids to give the alternative and be specific about that. You can give me a high five. So please stop hugging me. I love high fives, right? Or please stop pulling on my hood. Let's go play basketball instead. So getting really, really specific and really, really clear with what, because um, just saying stop, that might not be clear to, to the child what behavior is making the person uncomfortable. Could even be like, please stop roaring so loud as a, you know, I like it when you use a little bit of a softer voice. So just getting, getting a lot of clarity. So saying exactly stop this, and what to do instead so that um, the person doesn't feel ostracized. They can still feel it's, it's you know, learning, learning how to participate. There can often be um, some lagging skills socially and emotionally. So having the peer group um, being specific about what is appropriate rather than just saying what the child can't do can be really great learning and um, really great growth. Um, if you'd like to go deeper with this, I really love the book um, Positive Discipline by Jane Nelson. It really gets uh, underneath what some of the misguided attempts might be for the behavior. It also really clarifies what's innocent behavior and what's misguided behavior, how to know the difference, like what to correct and what to just understand that that might just be part of the disability Children have a fixed IQ, true or false? Yeah, definitely false. But it's really until quite recently that we thought, you know, you're born, you're you're born and your brain is kind of like a computer and what you get is what you get. And you're kind of stuck with that for life. But now we know that the brain is always changing. The brain, the brain is plastic. The brain can change and evolve. And so the advances in neuroplasticity and neuroscience and knowing from the moment we take our first breath until um, our last breath that our, we can always learn and our brain can always change. So it's really um changing how we see disability and potential. I don't want to sound like I'm just coming from an ableist perspective, but I'm talking more from just what, there's so many more possibilities, more possibilities than we imagined uh, before. <clears throat> so I, when uh, Tyler was born, I learned a lot about neuroscience and there's so much 
um, out there about even for ourselves, how we can continually um, help our brain adapt and change and grow. It's incredible, really. Um, you know, this book in particular, I don't know if anyone here has read it, but it talks about, you know, a woman with half a hemis brain hemisphere and how she, she was able to rewire her brain to um, go about her daily life after a brain injury. So, so incredible what the brain can do. So I got really fascinated about, you know, how, how can we help kids become really potent learners, no matter what um, neurodiversity or obstacles they might face, there's always potentiality. So my, my mind is always looking at opportunities for growth, opportunities to support. You know, nowadays people with Down syndrome are graduating from university, they're getting married, they can drive. These things were thought impossible before, absolutely impossible. Um, one tip that I would say um, is making accommodations instead of allowances for people with disabilities. So one example of this is um, Tyler was doing spelling homework, our son Tyler, and I noticed that the teacher had marked correctly. He had to put um, words in alphabetical order. So he'd made this attempt and she just marked it all right, but it wasn't right. And so to me, that's an allowance, it's sort of like, okay, he made an attempt, yay, um, which is fine. Maybe her goal was just to have him work more independently. I don't actually know what her, her actual goal or what she had in mind. So I wanna be kind of fair and gracious, um, but you know, our son has, um, dyspraxia, which makes it really difficult for him to visualize things. So to kind of hold the alphabet visually in his head is difficult. So an accommodation for that might be to have the alphabet strip on his desk and he uses that as a visual cue to help him put things in order. So that would be one small accommodation to help him do the task rather than just letting him do whatever because an allowance isn't actually giving him the steps he needs to learn that task. So hopefully that makes sense. And sometimes we're like, oh, it's okay, it's fine. Um, that happens a lot where people kind of don't hold our son accountable or help teach him the rules of the game, say, or things like that. So um, instead, are there ways that you could break that task down into smaller, smaller bits to help um, him think of it like a staircase? What are little steps to help him achieve um, the same the same things to be part of that game or to, to do that task or how can we help accommodate to be successful. And I would also say, what do you think? Inclusion is the choice, true or false? Oh, thanks, Vida. Yeah. Critical tip. Yeah. And it's hard sometimes to know um, as a teacher, speaking as I, you know, I was a teacher for 18 years. Sometimes it's difficult to know where is that zone of proximal development, where is enough challenge for it to be really engaging for a child, and where is it just too much of a challenge where that child will shut down or feel frustrated. So it really takes some fine attunement for a teacher to see where can I, when is it push in time and when is it cushion time really for a child, but really trying to attune to that to make sure we're still offering challenge and engagement that's uh, really gonna benefit the child, help them feel a sense of mastery, sense of power, um, you know, having those kind of choices, mastering something that's challenging is so good for our esteem. It feels so incredible. That's one of those psychological needs for kids. Uh, inclusion is absolutely a choice. I'm gonna play you a little video um, that was recently done, which I, are um, actual ways that kids weren't included. 
Give me a sec here. You give me a thumbs up if you can see the YouTube. Okay, great. And I'm gonna press play and just assume you can hear. If you can't hear, stop me. Actually, let me just make sure I've done for good sound. One second. Here we go. <clears throat> Inclusivity. There's only one trick left if you still don't want to be inclusive, and that is to find. All the ridiculous excuses you're about to hear have been given for real. Come on, kiddos, get on that bus. So, why can't my kids come on the field trip again? Because we're not prepared for this. It's not you, my dear. It's us. Ridiculous excuses not to be inclusive. Hey, uh, do you have any slots available for the judo class? Of course. Your son can come in on Tuesdays at 10 in the morning. But he's at school at 10 in the morning. Oh, well, that's the only time slot we have available. Right, Jack? Huh? Ridiculous excuses not to be Hello, my daughter would like to join the summer camp. I'm sorry, but we already have one of those kids. Hi. Hi, I'm here for the meeting. The thing is, we don't have enough chairs. Yeah. Yes? I would love to join a theater class. I'm sorry, we closed registration literally 10 minutes ago. just stop the video <clears throat> um i don't want to speak for nishma but um you know oftentimes we face a lot of barriers wanting to have our children um, join just typical uh, things that other kids can join so um i just say how much i appreciate people on this call right now um you know it says a lot about your character and and um there will probably be, should be <laughs> other people, maybe not at your school, <laughs> but in other places who um, uh, can help our kids feel more included. We fa still face so many barriers and I think it's it's leftover uh, biases really from how people with disabilities have been viewed in our province and our nation wide. Um, so, Thank you for being here. And I would imagine willing to model inclusion to your children and being willing to learn about inclusion. Um, I think if, I don't know where people on this call are in your journey in inclusion, uh, but what I would say, what I've most appreciated, uh, I'll tell you a story of one mom who came to me and said that her son was asking a lot of questions about Tyler and that she told her son, I'm gonna speak to Ty's mom and find out more and I'll get back to you because she really wanted to be sure that the language she was using with her child was similar to the language we were using to talk to Tyler. And I just so appreciated how honest and vulnerable she was with me is that she didn't really know how to answer some of the questions. And so I would say if you're ever wondering or you don't know, uh, I will speak for a lot of parents. Like we do really appreciate when People come to us and they want to have these conversations and use these kind of sometimes uncomfortable uh, conversations to be really big learning opportunities for our family and for our world. And so if um, 
if your child is asking questions, it's, you know, definitely embrace that curiosity, welcome that curiosity. Um, if you, if you are familiar with talking about um, people with disabilities, then you know to keep it really simple and in language they can understand. Very matter of fact, like, oh, you have an arm, that person uses a wheelchair. Like, it's just very like matter of fact um, in, in our tone and, and keeping it as positive as possible. And also really drawing similarities and parallels between uh, friends, helping see commonalities, not just difference. And if we don't know, find out. And um, yeah, I see Nishma's comment. Nishma, do you want to just say that out loud? Maybe I think that, that this is your community and it might be really great for parents to know that. All right, there we go. Yeah, I was just saying, I'm, I'm always happy to answer any questions. I think everybody on this call for the most part knows me. Um, and knows how to get in contact with me. And if you you have questions or your kids have questions, um, please don't be shy. We're, we're always happy to to help wherever we can. Yeah, and it's it's okay not to know. Like, there's lots of things that I'm still learning. How to be more inclusive. Um, how to um, make the world better for everyone, not just people with disabilities. I'm learning to make sure food's halal or kosher or just simple ways that we can make people feel a sense of belonging when they're in our care or in our companies. So um, when people really go that extra mile, like being more proactive to invite the people on play dates or inviting to birthday parties, reading books is another way. Um, Having there's so much great literature out there. Librarians are are great resources to help point out different books. Um, yeah, Sarah, I see you have your hand up. Do you have a question or a comment? There we go. Uh, yeah, I just have a comment as well. I I also have I have two kids. One has a disability and one doesn't. I always say yet or like now or you know. Yeah. Yeah. We all experience ability and disability at different times in our lives for different reasons. But um, I would just echo what you say that just using the language of disability uh, neutrally as part of, you know, the vast diversity of the human experience that that sends the message, I think, that that it's it's not something shameful. It's not something that we kind of talk about in a hush hush way. Um, and I would just extend that by saying I think it's also important to, to bring ableism, at, like to make that part of our language, to talk about exclusion, to talk about ableism. And I think kids are really good at doing that, sort of focusing on just the really tangible, like, you know, is this, is this bus accessible to people who might use mobility devices or, yeah. you know, just, just really pointing out like, what are the examples in our environment or in our classrooms, or in our whatever spaces we're in, of people not being able to participate for different reasons, in the same way that we strive to make, you know, racism part of our everyday conversations, and colonialism, like our kids are learning about colonization in, in a way that I certainly didn't as mm -hmm. a person. Um, Patriarchy. <laughs> I, I feel like we have a, we are becoming much more fluent as parents and as educators in talking about yeah, gender, racism, colonization, but disability, there's still a great silence and discomfort, I think, around disability. And I feel like that's an area that, yeah, there's just a lot, a lot of room to kind of just practice, like practice different ways of talking about it in our, in our families and in our classrooms. Yeah. And just being open for it to be a learning opportunity. I really like that you've brought up, you know, ableism, like I'm mindful it's a fine line, right? Of, of there's these biases of like not regarding value to people with disabilities, but then not having to kind of prove someone's value, even if they're not verbal or they're, you know, that every human life has value. And um, so it, that's a fine line that I'm, I'm mindful of too, that I see a lot of barriers for our son where he, um, you know, because of people's attitudes that he's maybe not getting as many opportunities that that could normally be available to him. But I also don't want to um, just focus on on ableism, too. So I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. 
hopefully I'm making sense, but yeah. Any other comments or questions? Well, I, I am here to stick around if people want to ask more questions privately. I know sometimes in front of a group, um, it can feel uncomfortable to ask out loud. So I'm happy to stick around after if anyone wants to have a conversation. I really appreciate being invited to your school and having so many people come out and be part of such an important conversation. Valerie, I'd like to um, thank you for sharing your family with us and all of your personal stories, as well as enlightening us um, with your insights. I know I've really appreciated and, and value the information that you've shared with us as an educator, um, as well as um, sharing your contact and how we can reach you. And um, if anybody has any questions or if you can offer any advice, um, you've got several sort of contacts on social media um, and a website as well. So or an email address. Um, thank you for that. And um, I can put my website in, but I, I think, um, you know, positive discipline. I'm just such an advocate. Like people think, oh, that doesn't apply to my child because my child is neurodiverse or but I just think. You know, if we move, you know, a lot of go-tos in the disability world is rewards and, and punishments or kind of behavior modification is usually the default. And, um, you know, a lot of people who are uh, adult advocates have said how hurtful and damaging that has been to them uh, growing up. So I, I um, really like to advocate for how can we uh, help children flourish without rewards and punishments? What does that look like? Um, that's really important to me. So that's a whole other <laughs> conversation, but um, it, it's something I hold really dear to my heart and try to shout from the mountaintops as much as I can that all kids deserve to flourish and be treated with dignity and respect. So absolutely. Yeah, I'll put in we'll a little plug. I've taken, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'll put in a little plug for that. I've taken both of Valerie's courses and definitely have learned so much on them as well. So thank you, Valerie. Oh um, yeah. Thank Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the, there's two, so I do just maybe a little like explanation. So I do two things. I do one, which is positive discipline and help parents see like, what does it look like to be kind and firm and to help our children meet those four psychological needs that, that every child deserves to have met. Um, in proactive and positive ways rather than in reactive ways. So that's one aspect of what I do. And the other thing I do is I teach the something called the Enneagram. And that's to help, you know, a lot of parents really want to move towards uh, more authoritative ways of parenting. So not being authoritarian and not being permissive, but that kind and firm sweet spot, what does that look like? Um, but there are some blind spots that tend to get in the way. So the Enneagram is a personality typing system that helps parents see what's blocking me from being present or showing up in the way that I really want to parent. So I help parents in a very compassionate way uh, discover some of their parenting blind spots and bring those into awareness so that we can show up the way we want to as parents more often, more responsive and less reactive, which is tough. It's <laughs> so hard. So. I just have a comment. Um, I'm constantly, constantly studying and learning and reading and talking to people. Um, and yet, um, I feel like I don't know anything. I feel like, I think I know this. I think I can handle this. And yet I still feel like it's going to be a journey for the rest of my life because I don't think you ever feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm good at this. I'm really good at this. I'm not bad at it but I'm not perfect. And um, every course that I take, every every person that I talk to, I try to take a pearl of wisdom away. And today I'm taking away um, your comment about not special needs, human needs. So that's going to be, you know, something that's going to be in the forefront of, 
my teaching and my understanding as well. It's so simple, right? Mm -hmm. Hi, Liam. <laughs> I see you there. <laughs> Anyway, right. I That's really you, sweet. And I, I saw in the comments too, someone said they're going to wait 10 seconds. That just makes my heart sing because uh, it's not only going to benefit people with disabilities, but other kids who might be shy and need time to collect their thoughts and um, just need more time. So many kids are, will benefit from, from that. Well, thank you, Valerie. It was, it was excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. And I love your um, openness and open-mindedness and I think as educators, if we're always willing to learn, that's a good place totally. to be. And then at the end of the day, trusting that inner wisdom and knowing, you know, you have that whole bag of trips, tricks, that whole repertoire, then yes. really getting present and knowing, okay, what's needed in this moment with this person right. and that's trusting, yeah. trusting that's that inner, inner attunement that you probably have innately. I hope so. Oh, I can tell already by how you're doing it. that's important to you. So just really trusting yourself, trusting that attunement. I think Sarah has a question. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah. Oh, you're on mute, Sarah. Thank you. Just another comment again is to add to your point about um, like curiosity about the child, I think curiosity about what's happening in their environment too. So to your point about like the 10 seconds, you know, at nine in the morning, my eldest child might be able to answer in two seconds, but like at seven at night, it might take her 10, you know, because of fatigue or like if she's in yeah. an environment and there's lots of, you like this whole... I feel like we're talking so much more about the site, the sensory dimension yeah. of the experience and of the environment and like really starting to learn more about like what is happening in people's bodies and brains that we don't, we don't see, but they're experiencing and to not jump to conclusions through our own lens. Yeah. And just because like you said, in that moment in time, they can, but then later on, they're still doing the best with the brain and body that they have, but it's, it's, they've reached capacity, you know, every person, whether they're a child, an adult, typical or neurodiverse, we all have a window of tolerance of, yeah, yeah. Right, of, of where we, we can regulate and then that can reach capacity. I just read this essay by an autistic writer this afternoon and he gives the example of like if you put your fingernail in your thigh you know it, it might hurt but you probably are not going to feel really wounded but if you put your fingernail like right along your gum line you're probably really going to feel that and he uses that as analogy as an analogy of like that's what my body feels like all the time that kind of sensory sensitivity um yeah so don't know right we just don't know how people are experiencing their environment as you say in their own bodies and brains so so, so like we need curiosity about that and a sense of not know truly not knowing and and related to what you're saying I think it's also really important to you know there's such diversity in how different disabilities manifest um, like that person saying their experience someone who's autistic might even have a different experience and and that we you know, I remember one man on a podcast saying he didn't realize until he was an adult that he was autistic because he'd seen Rain Man and it's like, I'm not that, right? So it's it's like really learning that there's such a spectrum and such diversity with neurodiversity and to um, be curious and, and open-minded about that. So yeah, everyone has different experiences and I feel like people are doing the best they can with the brains and bodies that they have. Yeah, I hope this was really helpful. I'm just, I'm recovering from COVID. I, I was traveling in Egypt and got COVID on the plane ride home. So I'm just kind of coming up for air. So I hope that I was coherent tonight. I, I tried my best, but um, I'm still, still on the recovery here. But um, thank you everybody for coming tonight and being part of this very important conversation. I think it makes the world better for everybody when we're mindful of these things. Thank you, Valerie. Such beautiful takeaways tonight. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending uh, this evening for this info session. Um, and we 
love to have you back, Valerie, for another um, great information session. <laughs> It was oh, very, I very would, informative. I so honored to come back. I love all things positive discipline. 